So thank you very much. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. So I'm going to hop on taking the hat. And it's nice to be here at UBLB. I always enjoy coming here. I have a collaboration with community, so I come here quite often. I'm going to start off not part of the talk, but because um, Dr. Laude had, had said something about it, which was the article I wrote on who's afraid of the GMO eggplant. And I just wanted to tell you that when I heard the news and I was in New York, um, it, really, it really was something that bothered me quite a bit because I felt that we needed to advance our biotechnology enterprise in the country, especially in agriculture. And the reality is GMO crops, the technology, inherently has no problems. The products we have to test to make sure that they're fine. But the technology itself is fine. And it's something that I feel very strongly about. Even though I don't do, by the way, I don't, I don't do GMOs at all. Uh, I mean, we do it a little bit for testing genes, but we, we don't do. I've never trans transformed a rice plant in my life. But I am a great believer that in trying to feed 9 billion people in the world in 2015, trying to feel 100 million Filipinos right now, we need all the tools um, in our power to try to meet the demands of a hungry world. And so I think it's very important. So that's just, that's just my, my, my start. Because it has nothing to do at all with my talk that I thought that I would, um, uh, I would start out with that. I give a very general title, The Evolution of Plant Genomes, um, uh, because what I'm going to tell you are a series of stories short story get together and we'll give you an overview of the importance of genomics in trying to understand diversity uh, and what that can tell us and help us in trying to understand things like conservation, things like breeding, and other aspects that we're all interested in. But I, I always start in these talks when I come to the Philippines because most people don't know who I am and where I'm from and what do I do in my lab. So we're, I, I come from a very agricultural university. I'm just a very agricultural place. This is the <laughs> southern tip of the island of Manhattan. And just if you want to know, my lab is right there. Um, we actually have a greenhouse there um, that we grow rice. They actually, it actually flowered, which was amazing to me that it actually flowered. Um, but you do not want to know how much it costs to build a greenhouse in downtown Manhattan. Let's just say it would cost the same as one of the big buildings here. <coughs> But I, my laboratory is at New York University. I, I've been at New York University since 2006, and nine years now. That's my our campus. We don't really have a campus. We, we, we have buildings in downtown Manhattan. We own a lot of buildings in downtown Manhattan. And so, you know, the people, the students go across normal streets just to get there. This is, if you've ever been to New York, this is Washington Square Park, which is actually a city park. People think it's our commons, it's our, it's part of NYU, it's not. It's a city park. Uh, that the students use. Uh, and I work um, two blocks from that part. This is the NYU Center for Genomics and Systems Biology. Um, I'm very proud of this building. I was one, I was hired from North Carolina State University in 2006 to be the senior, one of the senior faculty at, at the Genome Center. Um, and I helped, um, I helped design this building, build it. I was the director of the center when we moved our laboratories two blocks into this new facility. So we're very proud of it. And, and I always welcome, especially Filipino scientists who come over, I always come give them a tour. Um, and, you know, sometimes they give them an office if they need in a few days. Um, but I actually have two laboratories, both NYU Center for Genomics and Systems Biology. This is our laboratory in, um, in New York City. But NYU actually is a big, no, it's not a big, but it's a campus in Abu Dhabi, in the Middle East. Um, and I actually have a laboratory there. I'm also the director of the Genome Center there. Um, and so I, I, I go back and forth between New York and Abu Dhabi, so I'm going to Abu Dhabi in two weeks. Oops, sorry. Um, so I have a lot of choice in New York City and Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. We have um, facilities for doing genomics. And this is my laboratory. Uh, this is the people in my laboratory. Um, it's a very international group. Um, I have people from every continent except Africa. Um, I have people from Canada, from France, from China, from Vietnam from Mexico, Lebanon, we've got only two Americans here. <laughs> you know, Argentina and Portugal. Um, you know, I've only had one Filipino in my lab in my career, and I really would like to see more uh, Filipinos come over. Um, it's a very international lab uh, that I have uh, in New York City. 
Um, and the, the central question that we're interested in is evolutionary biology. That is, we want to understand how organisms evolve. Okay? Um, we want to understand what is the genetic basis for the diversity of life in the on the planet. So that's our central question. And in order to address these questions, we take, we take, into, we, we take into account one thing that we've known now for a long time, that the genomes of species have a record of the evolutionary history of that species. Okay? So if you can look in the genome of a species, you can, if you can read it properly, you can understand how that species has evolved. Okay? And you can do that by looking and sequencing genes or genomes from multiple individuals within that species or between different species. So here's an old study. This was actually based on one of the first studies I did as a faculty member about 20 years ago at North Carolina State University, where I looked at the gene um, that was responsible for a floral, it was a floral gene, but the cauliflower gene in Herbidopsis. It made small cauliflowers. Uh, and I sequenced that gene in, I believe it was 17 individuals. Um, so this was about 18 years ago. Um, and by looking at the variations, you can see um, molecular variants here, mutations in the gene. By looking at the amount of those mutations and how they're patterned, that hopefully will tell us something about how this gene is evolving and how the species where this gene is not evolving. That was what we were doing 18, 20 years ago. This is based on a paper that's now submitted in the plant cell. Now, instead of looking at a single gene, we can look at the entire genome. What are these? Each of these is an individual. This is from an algae, Chlamydomonas reinhardii. Um, and each of these is the amount of single nucleotide polymorphisms or mutations across the entire genome of, that, of each of that algae. So we have the amounts of mutations we find across the 17 chromosomes of that algae. So in 20 years, the technology has has increased tremendously. When before that we were looking at single genes, now we can look at single genomes, individual genomes, and sequence it relatively easily um, in order to get the information we want. So the data has now expanded. And the other thing is that um, we integrate that with computer models for how the process of evolution works. Now, Kakatakata, this is a little scary. Um, but believe me, actually, you can, you, can, you can figure it out what, what this is. This is actually from a collaborator which I'll talk about later. This is, the, um, this is the diffusion equation for the dynamics of mutations in a population. Uh, and, and, and getting data like this and integrating that with um, computational models for how evolution works allows you to start to read those sequences and tell you something about evolution. So my lab works in a number of different species um, that we work on. Climbing the monas. Actually, this one we're probably not going to continue working on this. This is a single cell algae that we work on. It's, it's, been, it, it's, it's been used as a model system for photosynthesis and flagellar behavior. But actually, it was interesting right now because uh, if it's possible applications in biofuel production, it actually makes uh, lipids that's interested in biofuels. So that's interesting, but we're not really interested in that. More Herbidopsis taliana, as many of you know, is a model plant system that's used by geneticists to try to study plant development. But a lot of my work is on crop species, uh, and I'll tell you why later on. Um, I would say um, 70%, 60%, 70% of my work is on rice, rice is a type. And now, rice of Leberima, the African rice, we're also working on, on both of those species. Uh, and then later on, I'll show you data on Phoenix, that to the current date ponds. Because of my lab in the in Abu Dhabi, you know, they don't grow rice. They grow a lot of date palms, and so I decided to start working on date palms as well. So, why are we interested in crop plants? As I told you before, I'm an evolutionary biologist, and the reason we're interested in crop plants comes from Darwin himself. So Darwin uh, wrote Origin of Species in 1859. And in Origin of Species, if you've ever uh, read it, the first chapter in Origin of Species talks about domesticated species. It talks about pigeon breeding, actually. Okay? Because what Darwin did, Darwin used the examples from breeding and the examples from domestic species in order to formulate his ideas of natural selection. 
Okay. So Darwin had been interested in domesticated species for a long time. And what he pointed out is that in these domesticated species, we might learn a lot about how evolution proceeds. And so that's what my lab does. It uses crop species as a model to study the evolutionary process. And at the same time, it hopefully helps readers. The information we gather about the evolution of that species and some of the techniques we apply can help readers uh, in their work. Why are we interested in it? Well, for one thing, crop species are very young species. Um, all crops, all food crops that are cultivated and domesticated existed, uh, have existed only in the last 12,000 years, which is very short considering that the flowering plants are probably around for 120 to 200 million years. And you know, land plants are around 500 million years. So these are very, the, the stuff we eat are all very recent um, species. Um, and the other thing that's interesting about crop species is that even though they've evolved very recently, you have seen, we have seen dramatic changes in how they look and how they, how, you know, what, what they produce, their sizes and so on. So as you many of you know, this is the Brassica racing complex. It's one species. We have cauliflower, broccoli, kale, cabbage, kohlrabi, Brussels sprouts. They're all the same species, subject to evolution under selection by humans. Um, and this is a, a, a rapid rate of evolution. This is a very, this, this is considered a very rapid rate of evolution. So we think of domesticated species as models for evolution. And so that's why we're studying them. And hopefully today I'll show you examples of crop plants um, that think something about how crops have evolved. It's hard to say what the definition of domesticated species is. There's probably no one universal definition. And me and collaborators have tried very hard to come up with a broad definition, and none of them really work completely. Um, but one of the ways we can talk about this is that domestic species are species whose reproduction is assured by humans to meet human needs. It's a very broad definition, um, but I think it probably works for most species. That includes the crop species we eat, but it includes things like ornamental species, roses, for example, flower, flower species, that we use for ornamental uh, purposes, livestock species that we eat, and pet species dogs or cats, things like that. Um, so these are all domestic species. This is a very conservative estimate. And there are estimates that say that it's probably ten, uh, tenfold larger, although I use a conservative estimate because I'm generally a conservative person. Um, there are probably 250 plant and 44 and land animal species that are known to be domesticated. But if you look at some literature, they'll say there's about 2,000 plant species um, that are domesticated. And one thing to also bear in mind is that domestication has evolved multiple times in, on the planet. We are aware of how humans have domesticated species. It's probably the most prominent example of domestication. But ants and beetles and termites have domesticated fungal species. They have actually invented agriculture. Um, so um, uh, Amazon leaf cutter ants will cut leaves and form fungal gardens. They will cultivate fungi. Uh, for their own use, um, and this has evolved uh, like several tens of millions of years ago. So we're not the only ones to domestic, domesticate species, but we're certainly the most prominent one. Worldwide, there are probably 24 regions in the world that have domesticated species. These are the centers of domestication that we know of. Um, and as I said, all of these regions started to domesticate about 12,000 years ago. Prior to that, so if you think of us as a species, humans, prior to 12,000 years ago, the way we gathered our food was we hunted and gathered. Right? That's how we ate as an animal. Right? We hunted for food, we gathered grain, we gathered berries and nuts, and whatever we could find. Starting about 12,000 years ago, the ecology of humans changed. And what changed was instead of relying on hunting and gathering, we started to rely on agriculture. We started to plant things. We started to herd animals. And that started about 12,000 years ago. It started 12,000 years ago in the Fertile Crescent, this region where the oldest known examples of agriculture started about 11,000, 11,500 years ago, are documented archaeologically. Okay. But agriculture, uh, agriculture but, but domestication and agriculture has evolved independently in many other parts of the world. So we think that China also developed agriculture independently in northern China, okay, and around the Yangtze Valley. And we know that other cultures that had no 
contact with the old world domesticated things because the new world domesticated squash, beans, and corn, and sunflowers, and they had no contact with the old world 11,000 years ago. So they did it on their own. So worldwide, humans started to change their behavior and how they dealt with plants. Uh, and that created these domesticated species that we now rely on for much of the food resources we have. Okay. And I think that studying evolution these crops and how these peoples developed new species in human societies, um, it also may give us clues as to how we can feed societies in the future. Okay. Because when they domestic species, by the way, the yields that they got increased dramatically. Um, and so these are just examples of early farms in our, our geological sites. This is in the Jordan Valley. 9,000 years ago, this is in China, about 7,000 years ago. These are archaeological sites of the years. So as I said, what we're, we're going to show now is we're going to look at um, examples using genomic data and how that changes our picture about how these crop species have evolved and what they can tell us um, about the process of evolution and also things that might interest the readers. A lot of the work that's done in my lab is in domesticated rice. Uh, and I don't, I don't think I need to introduce rice. Usually I talk on margins that there's no rice very much, except for sushi. Um, but, 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 you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm certain everybody here knows what rice is. But maybe what you may not know, it's, it's, it's a large calorie source for the world. About a third, some say a half of the calorie sources in food in the world comes from rice. Okay, it originated from a wild progenitor, a rice root of bogon that still grows in southern Asia. And I started, you know, people ask me how I started in rice. I'll tell you a little secret. This is how I started in rice. I actually was working in Herbidopsis Savannah. That was the major system I was in. I wanted to work in crop plants. And what I wanted to do was an excuse to come, to come home. I needed an excuse. I was working in the United States. And I needed an excuse to come home regularly. And so a postdoc in my lab came to me and said, and I said, look, let's work on rice. And, uh, and I, I think our first project was looking at the um, sticky rice and the gene and sticky rice. But I, I went with it for a scientific reason, but I could have chosen any crop in the world, but I chose rice not only because it's of importance, but because it's a crop that I'm interested in that is meaningful to me culturally. I come from the Philippines and that's what we eat. So that's how I started. Um, and one of the first projects that we did just to start to get experience in genomics was we wanted to look at the level of variation in rice using molecular data. And this was a project, this was one of the first big projects, genomics projects at Rice. And what we did was that we sequenced um, 120 genes across the rice genome. And we sequenced it across the different variety groups of rice. So the Japonica, Stigica, Alice, and aromatic rices. And also some wild rice, the rice of the roof of And when we got the data for the 122 genes, we put the data all together and created a phylogeny of rice to see how these different groups are related to each other. And what we saw was something that had already been seen by many others a long time ago. So this was not new. We just used better data to get it, but it's not new. That Japonica and aromatic rice groups together, and genetically they're different from Indic and Alf rices. Okay? So these two rice groups are different genetically from each other. Uh, and they form two very distinct groups. As I said, this is something that had been known for a long time. This is, something that, this is not something that um, uh, was unique to, to our study. Um, and because this had been known for a long time, it had, uh, the origin of rice was thought to occur something like this. That a rice of Rufi Kodwan is a wild species that grows in South, southern and southeast Asia. And then about 9,000 years ago, Japonica was domesticated in the Yangtze Valley, China. And sometime in the 8,500 years ago, indica rice was domesticated independently in the Ganges Valley, India. And that's why you see these two groups of rice. Because there were multiple origins of multiple domestications of rice. One in China and one in India. Okay? So that was the story. That was the story put in this paper um, seven, eight years ago now. Um, that's how we thought things would happen. So then technology moves on, and we became a little more ambitious. We just did 122 genes randomly. So for the next phase of the project, instead of doing just 122 genes, I said, let's sequence every gene 
a gene every 500,000 base pairs along three rice chromosomes. So we can see how variation differs across a rice chromosome. So we looked at rice chromosomes 8, 10, and 12. And what we did was we sequenced fragments of a gene every 500 kb across that. And I forgot the size of this, but this is about 800 gene fragments that we sequenced. Uh, and we had to build the bioinformatics pipeline to do this. And we did it in those varieties of rice and also wild rice. Okay? And to summarize, this is just a summary of the data. You don't need to know the details. But this is just, for example, this is chromosome 8. And this shows you the amount of nucleotide variation across chromosome 8. There are regions that are very high in variation. There's regions that are very low in variation. Okay? So you can see that variation is distributed across these chromosomes. You can see that in the centromere, there's very little variation. The centromeres, um, so you can start to see patterns. So this is a project that um, we did in collaboration with a, a good friend of mine who's a really well-known population geneticist, Carlos Bustamante. And Carlos Bustamante had developed, he works in human genetics primarily, and he developed this method to take the data, the kind of data that we have, and try to infer the pattern of how the species is evolved. Okay? And, and I'll explain it like this. He took that equation that I showed you earlier, the diffusion equation, and he said, based on this diffusion equation, if we can um, specify models for how evolution has occurred for these species, what we can do is we can use this equation and try to fit the parameters of that model and see which models are better to explain how that species is evolved. Okay. And he called this program DADI for def uh, demographic analysis, diffusion approximation for demographic inference. That was what it was called, the DADI program. And they'd use it in humans, and they'd use it in dogs, and I said, let's use it in dogs. And so we developed this model, so we, 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 you know, we got a piece of paper to sketch out, okay, this is a model for how rice is evolved that you had wild rice. This is the model that is based on what everybody thinks is the right model. That this is wild rice, and then sometime in the past, japonica rice has evolved. And then later on, in a certain time interval, how indigo rice evolved from the same wild ancestor. Okay? And we can also say, look, you know, these things are not isolated. They might be um, interbreeding with one another. So let's put, uh, you know, migration parameters. We have how long domestication took, when they occurred, the size of the population. So you put all of that in the model. Okay. So that's the model. And remember that model is based on what everybody believes is true. Um, and I'm still not sure why we decided to look at another model. I, I, I forgot the thought process that involved. But we needed to look at that model. We said, let's look at another model just in case. And the model was instead of rice evolving twice, it evolves once. So in this model, this is wild rice. You have domestic rice evolve, and then Indian and Japonica split afterwards. So you can see the difference between these two models. In one case, Indian and Japonica split separately. In this case, it split once, and then you split from each other. And you can get the parameters and estimate the parameters. And what you do is you calculate the likelihood. Um, and the story here goes, so I was leading a big collaboration for this project. So I was at NYU. Uh, Carlos Bustamante was at Stanford, and part of that collaboration was Scott Jackson at Purdue University, and um, uh, Elizabeth, uh, yeah, Elizabeth Shaw at uh, Washington University. And so we were having one of our annual meetings, so we get all of the students and all of the postdocs and all of the collaborators together in one room. Uh, and this one it was being hosted by Washington University in St. Louis. So we go, and Carlos' postdoc shows the data. And this is the model, but you, you don't have to rely on this. This is just the result of the simulations based on the model and how well they fit the data. But this is what you should look at. You look at those two types of models, the single model, the single founder model, and the double founder model. The double founder model remembers what we think is true. The single founder model, we don't think that's true. But if you look at the likelihood of the models, the presentation went like, the likelihood of the double founder model, which we thought was true, is actually lower than the likelihood of the single founder model. Okay. In other words, the data and the, the data with the model together, and the data with this technique, 
was saying the likelihood was higher that Rice domest was domesticated only once, not twice. And I remember looking at Carlos. Carlos Bustamante is a dear friend of mine. He's Venezuelan-American. He won the MacArthur Genius Award. So he's a certified genius. And then if you don't, if you're a scientist, you want the MacArthur Award. Because what the MacArthur Award does, it gives you $500,000, and you can do anything you want. If you want to buy a car with it, you can buy a car with it. If you want to put it into your research, that's fine too. Most people will buy a house with their MacArthur. See, he won one of these MacArthur Awards. Um, and I said, Carlos, you're wrong. Something is wrong here. Okay, I don't believe, I don't believe these results. This is just wrong. The model is too complicated or something. The first thing I said was, did you take into account that selection, these are domesticated species, so there's a lot of selection going on. Can you incorporate selection model? So they went away, they incorporated selection, and the results are still the same. And these are significantly different. And I said, I still don't believe it. You're wrong. I don't know what to do, but that clearly is wrong. So the leader of my research group for rights was a, a Filipina, uh, Jean Molina. She got her PhD at Rutgers in uh, systematics, and she was working as the lead person in my rice project. And so she comes to me after the meeting and says, Michael, what I'd like to do is I'd like to go back through the literature and see what is the evidence that rice has actually evolved twice. What is, really, where is that evidence coming from? And I said, don't bother. The, the, that evidence is solid. Carlos is clearly wrong. Don't, just, just do something else with your time. This is crazy. The thing is, she didn't listen to me. She did it anyway, and I'm glad she did it. This is Jean Molina, and she's now a professor at Long Island University, just down the road from where we are. And I'll show you a project of hers later on. So this was a, a news at, at GMA News. She was being interviewed for another project that she had. So she went to the literature and she said, let's look at what's going on here. And she discovered several things. One was, at the time that we were discussing this, a paper came out in the Journal of Systematic Biology that suggested why all of the previous results were wrong. And the problem with that is, if you have molecular data from recently evolved species, okay, usually what you do is you get data from many genes, right? Because you know that one gene alone doesn't have enough signal to tell you what the relationships are. So you get data from many genes. And because every individual gene doesn't have a lot of signal, what you do is you put all the genes together, treat them like they were one big super gene, and analyze it as one. And a paper came out in 2011 in, um, in systematic biology, I believe, that said if you do that for recently evolved species, in some cases, you can be as wrong as 75% of the time. In other words, the relationships you get are going to be wrong 75% of them, or there are some conditions for that. So in other words, the thing that everybody does is when you take these individual genes and try to get a signal, you put them all together so you can get one big data set, treat them like one, is the wrong way to do it. The right way to do it was also came out in the same year. And it was a program called BEAST. Nation Evolutionary Analysis by Sampling Trees. What this does is if you have data from different genes, don't put them together and treat them like one. Analyze each of the genes separately, but then integrate it together, the analysis together somehow. And that's what BEAST does. It takes the data from each of the individual genes and it integrates them together. And what she did, she did something that was clever. She said, she went back to papers that had been published, and all of these papers, there were um, six papers and all molecular data that showed two origins of rice. Okay? All of these have concluded two origins of rice. She took their same data, she didn't change it, she took their same data and analyzed it with these. And the result of her analysis is that for those data sets that had a large number of genes, it actually supported a single origin model. In other words, everybody had done it wrong. Including ourselves, by the way, although I don't think we analyze our data here. We our data. But everybody had done it wrong. And when you use this new method, you actually get support for a single origin. And it, it was even better. You could actually date when things occurred. 
with this with this um, with this algorithm. So a point to that um, rice split from Rufin Bolgod about 8,200 years ago, and Indica split from Japonica about 3,900 years ago. Okay, so you were able to date when things occurred. And why is that interesting? Because if you look at Chinese archaeological sites on rice, the earliest examples of rice where it's clear that it was domesticated was in the range of about five to 6,000 and you're getting to see cultivation of about 9,000 to 7,000 years. Okay. So there's a long history of cultivation of rice in China um, that was starting to occur. In India, you had a different situation in the archaeological record. In the archaeological record, you really don't start to see rice until about 4,500 years. I, I should say it, it, uh, that, that, that's too simplistic. What you see in the archaeological record is that people were doing something in India, but it was a very low level. They were either harvesting wild rice or they were doing some planting, but it was not an intensive agricultural system. When rice began to take off in India, by looking at the archaeological record, it was starting about 4,000 years ago. And it is coincident with, when you look at the, 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 the archaeological remains, you see a lot of rice starting 4,000 years ago, and you see a lot of implements that were influenced clearly by China. So what we think happened based on this is that we can change our understanding of the origin of rice. Um, we have a rice of Rupipogon, uh, and then we had Japonica rice about 9,000 years ago, and then about the same time they were doing something in India, but not intensively. Either they were harvesting wild rice or they were developing a proto-Indica, so something was going on, but not at a very uh, uh, intensive level. Japonica evolves, spreads, and then 4,000 years ago, India got Japonica rice. And it started to hybridize with whatever was going on in India, and that gives rise to Indica rice. That's the model we proposed in the paper. And so this was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Um, and of course, it created a lot of controversy. Uh, because it was going against what people had said. Uh, and in fact, a, a, a Chinese group actually challenged us in press. I mean, they, they wrote a letter to the editor of the NASS, this is why the Molina paper is wrong. There's four things, and the beauty is that their arguments were actually pretty weak. So we could go back and say, well, you're saying we're wrong, it's actually wrong. So here's, here's why we won that. And, but the way to do this is hopefully another group is going to help you. And, Beijing Genome Institute helped us. Because they did another study that was published two, uh, uh, a few years later in which they looked at a different data set looking at genes that were involved in domestication. And they came up based on their data with the same model we had, which is the domestication of Japonica, it crossed with something in India, gave rise to Indica. Same model. So now we have two different groups telling the same thing based on different data sets. So that makes us feel good. But when you do something controversial with rice, you always get a lot of press. This is the press we got. Rice trace a single domestication event in China. That was that from BBC. From the Hong Kong newspaper, and we love this one. US study backs China, the great rice debate. Big debate in rice. And the one from Jakarta, US study on origin of rice sparks Sino India Rao. Like they were gonna like start killing each other or something. <laughs> By the way, my research team that involved this large collaboration of people from both China and India. So we were kind of we, we weren't taking sides. We really had a group. It was, it, was, it was very interesting. But what does this tell us? What is all of this telling us? It's telling us that molecular data is beginning to get them, allow us to rethink how crop species evolve. And there are other examples I could give in which we thought crop species evolved one way, and now with modern genomic data, there's tools, the molecular, the, the computational tools. We're now rethinking how things are happening. The other thing that's happening is that we can now look at complex history. Not just very simple histories, but we can look at complexity. So now we can say, oh, it's not just something originates, then they go somewhere, they breed with something, and something originates from that. So we can integrate that into these models. And I think that that's beginning to revolutionize how we look at these species. Now, what am I doing? I'm doing several things now with rice. Uh, it's too many to mention. I'll just so mention one small thing that this is, by the way, preliminary results. Uh, and this was done by uh, a woman in my lab, Karen Hicks, who was a sabbatical visitor. 
Uh, and this is very preliminary, so I wouldn't take it, but I think it's showing us inside. One of the things we know about rice is that it actually um, grows in a wide ecological range. That is, you have things like paddy lowland rice, red upland rice, or deep water rice. You have rice growing in a, a variety of different ecological systems in terms of agriculture. And one thing that I've always been interested in is the evolution of upland rices. Okay, where did those come from? And since I'm from the Philippines, I said, well, it's definitely an upland rice. But I thought, would it be fun to look at something like the rice terrace and see the rice were going there? So uh, we went to Erie and looked at their database. We got 18 Cordillera rices, and include the Pino one rices, which are the terrace rices in Pinigua, which are grown in the region, but they're non terrace rices. Uh, and, you know, this, this was grown, according to Erie, this was um, from different parts of uh, the region collected as old as 50 years ago, or more actually in some cases. Uh, and we just, we're just beginning to look at the results. I said this is very preliminary, but it, it's kind of interesting. The terrace rises, the Pinot one rises, are japonica rises. We, we kind of knew that. They grew in japonica, but, but Pinidwa, there's some Pinidwa that's japonica, there's some Pinidwa that's Indica, according to our data. Okay? And the interesting thing is this paper came out uh, by a Chinese group that looked at japonica and up, irrigated and upland japonica rices. And so we said, let's take their data, look at our data, and see where things are. And the thing that was interesting is that the upland rices form a separate group from the irrigated japonica rices. And the terrace rices, whether they're Kinoan or Pinidwa, are a separate group of upland rices. Okay? Um, Again, this is preliminary, but we think what's possible is Pinidua is an upland rice in the Philippines, and it gave rice to Pinidua um, as an, an irrigated upland rice. That is, it grows at an upper elevation. Uh, but so we're beginning to continue to analyze that data. The other thing I'm beginning to do with rice, I mean, I'm doing, as I said, a lot of things, but one of, I'm, I'm fascinated by our traditional varieties. Uh, and one day, I think I was sick about six months ago. I don't know what I was doing. I was reading Doreen Fernandez, who many of you might know is a food historian, a Philippine food historian. Doreen Fernandez was talking about in this paper about these dictionaries, Spanish dictionaries, that had listed how traditional Filipinos dealt with rice. And these were dictionaries in the 17th and 18th centuries, and in some cases, 19th centuries. So I looked at these dictionaries. This is one for, uh, for uh, the dictionary of the language of people from Spanish, this is 1863. This is a, like an 18th century dictionary of Tagalog. And if you look at how they describe rice, they actually name varieties of rice that were growing 100, 200 years ago. Okay, so this was before scientific breeding of rice. These were the very traditional varieties. And again, you know, the Erie collection is wonderful because I found 30 traditional rice varieties in the Erie collection that were mentioned in these very old texts. So I'm, I'm hoping to sequence these rice varieties in the next few months. Uh, we, have, we, have the, we have the term class in this. I'm just waiting for a master student or something to come and say they're interested. Let's do that. So that's the rice story that I wanted to say. I wanted to say something a little bit about what my other lab at Upper Valley is doing. It's also about crop plants. Uh, and this is a pro, uh, you know, when, when I put in my lab in Abu Dhabi two years ago, I decided to work on date palms because it is the indigenous crop of the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and we had this thing, let's, let's sequence 100 varieties of date palms. Um, and so we called it the 100 dates project. And said, so let's sequence 100 date palm varieties. It turns out that's harder than it sounds. If this was rice, this would have been over in like six months. The problem with date palms is unlike rice where there, are, there is theory, which is a central repository of germplasm in the world, there is no central repository of date palm varieties in the world. You have to go country by country. And interesting countries, Pakistan, Sudan, Iraq, Syria. Kuwait, Syria, one by one to get the varieties. I had some postdocs who were very good. Anyway, we got in the middle of the Syrian civil war, we got a FedEx package from Damascus that gave us the DNA for four of their varieties. We had a collaborator fly from the University of Baghdad. Um, and getting him a visa to the UAE from Baghdad was a little bit tricky, but we got him and he brought in several varieties. We, had, we, we were approached by one of the local governments in Pakistan, we were at the Date Palm Festival, and he said, you should come to Pakistan. The, I, and the first person says, 
you should do the research. Come to Pakistan. We will provide security. Anyway, in the second sentence is we will provide security. <laughs> send it to, here's, here's our address, send us the varieties. But we're able, but it's still difficult to assemble all the varieties. Uh, and, and, and people there really, it's, it's, it's hard. But we're able, there is a lot of variation in big bombs across the region, uh, in North Africa and in the Middle East. And so we've managed to sequence 60 new varieties right now. And we're on the way to sequencing 100. Um, and so we want to do that, as I say, to trace origin and evolution of date bombs and map genes. So I, I'll show you some initial results. Um, this is, uh, actually this is a lesser group. This is only 37 varieties and where they're from that we've sequenced um, for, for date bombs. Uh, this is a summary of the data. Actually, this is now wrong. Uh, this is from 37 varieties. There were 10.8 million mutations. We actually data from 62 varieties. It's about 12 million mutations. And a lot of the mutations, um, there's a lot of heterozygosity in date bombs because they're also crossing species. So it has a high level of heterozygosity. Interestingly, the Middle East date bombs look like they're more inbred than North African date bombs. There are large areas of the genome that are homozygous in the uh, Middle East date bombs. If you compare North African and Middle Eastern date bombs, they're actually genetically distinct, sort of like Indica and Japonica. And in Egypt and the Sudan, there's a hybrid zone where they're hybridizing. So if you think India, uh, North Africa on one end, and Middle East on another, they're meeting in Egypt and they're forming hybrids. Uh, and so these are some things we're looking at. The other thing is that we're looking at P mutations in date bomb that might explain certain traits. So we know that the, um, the ripening of the date bomb fruit takes about um, uh, five months, and what happens is that starch is synthesized during the ripening, and then becomes sucrose, and then it's broken down to glucose and fructose. And that different dates, by the way, if you have the different varieties, um, they can have different levels of sweetness. Okay, so ajwa from Saudi Arabia is not very sweet. Sukari, I'm from the word sucrose, so they give us sucrose sugar. It's actually very sweet. Okay, so the sukari variety. Um, and so we know that there's variation among the, there, this was a study done uh, in Egypt a long time ago that showed different levels of sugars in different date bomb varieties. And we think that this is uh, due to the production of sugars and how it's deposited. So if you look at the, me uh, at the um, metabolic um, network for making sugars, several of the key genes in this network, when you look at our data, you see mutations that knock out the gene. Okay, so this is a hexose transporter. It brings glucose outside of the cell into the cell. There is a stop glucose mutation segregating. It, it is at the end of the gene, so it might not have much of an effect, but there's certainly a premature stop glucose mutation. This is what's really interesting. It's hexokinase. It produces glucose, glucose 6-phosphate. Again, there's a stop glucose mutation. And phosphokinase, there are mutations that knock out this gene. So we don't know if this is true, but it may be that the mutations are telling us something about the sugar, the sugar level of dates. We're also interested in fruit color. Um, if you look at dates, the North Africans like yellow dates. In the Middle East, they're more mixed. They like both red and yellow dates. If you look at the anthocyanin biosynthetic pathway, and you look at our data, the chalcone synthase gene is segregating for a null, what we believe is a null mutation. OK, so it might affect color. Um, Disease resistance, we're also looking at disease resistance. Dates actually have fewer disease resistance genes than most other plant species, similar to bananas, which have very few um, disease resistance genes. And what we're finding is we're able to catalog all of the different types of disease resistance genes. We're finding knockouts as well. We're finding um, turnover of genes at a rapid rate. So all of this is we're trying to write a paper right now in date. So this is another story of how you can use molecular data in the genomic era to look at possible mutations and interesting networks of genes that you can then use to see if they can be used to improve a variety or, or deliver a different type of variety that you may want. And to also understand how, how, how the system, that evolution works. So those are some of the stories I want crop species. I'd like to end the story with a different species. Um, that's not one of these, but it's a story of biodiversity. It's a story of Philippine biodiversity. And it's a story that we have a rich amount of biodiversity in the country. 
And you can make really interesting discoveries if you just find the right thing to look at, if you just stumble on things to look at. So this is a project which we call the Biodiversity Genome Building of Asia. And this study was started by Jean Molina in my lab. Jean Molina, remember, was the person who had, had led the Rice Project, right? Um, and Jean uh, then became a professor at Long Island University. And she wanted to, the Philippine Genome Center was starting, and we were trying to come up with ideas. And one of the things, since I'm an international advisory board at the Philippine Genome Center, so I said to um, some of the scientists in UB Data I said, we should do something that is high profile, that will get attention, and that we can do quickly. And I said I was willing to help, and Jean was willing to help in her lab as a collaboration with the Philippine Genome Center. So we said Reflesia. Unfortunately, Reflesia has absolutely no economic importance whatsoever. Nothing. Zero. I think they're using it as a herbal medicine in Malaysia. It's probably a bad idea. Um, but it has no economics importance uh, whatsoever. So convincing the government to do this was not going to work out. So what did we do? We just used the money in our lab. We just said, let's just do it. Okay. And do it. And so what she did was we, we, we put together a team of people from different parts. From, um, uh, so Long Island and NYU were the lead, Philippine Genome Center, and from different uh, from New Zealand and Illinois and New York uh, colleges to put together a team to work on Reflesia very quickly. Our goal was to sequence the genome of Reflesia. And really, at the bottom of this was to try to highlight the fact that the Philippines was a biodiversity hotspot. Okay? So we're one of the mega biodiversity hotspots of the world. Many of you know this. Uh, uh, in, 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 in the Philippines, the island groups, each of these places, the island groups, is a center for endemism. We have tenfold more diversity than, say, the Galapagos Islands, which we know is very diverse. We are one of the highest hectare per hectare in the world, the ones that are remaining. And at least 60% of island endemics in the Philippines are globally rare. Okay, so we really have a lot of biodiversity in the country if we just try to protect them. Rofflesia is an interesting example of that. It was a species that was discovered in the uh, 18th century. Uh, and we know it's a species uh, that grows in Southeast Asia, island and mainland Southeast Asia. It's a parasitic plant. So a lot of you know the, the, the story of Rofflesia. You see the flower. This is the Rofflesia flower. Um, but what it is, is it grows on this host plant, that just stigma, which is related to grapevines. Okay? And the, the, it, it, it lives as, I don't really know how, within the vine. Uh, and then when it decides to flower, it will burst these buds. So all you have with Rafflesia are these large buds, these large flowers. And it really has, there are no leaves, there are no roots, it's just one large flower and whatever is allowing it to live within the vine. Okay? And the thing about Rafflesia is that it had long been thought that there were a few Rafflesia species in the Philippines. That's now changing. In the last decade, almost every year a new Rafflesia species is being named in the Philippines. Some, by the way, from, from those mines, right? Because uh, I forget there's a person here who works on Rafflesia. But I did, uh, forget who. But, but there's a big Rafflesia expert here. But we're naming a lot of their, not me, but the community is recognizing different Rafflesia species in the Philippines that are just being discovered. Many of them are single island endemics or small island endemics. So Varicosa is a new one that was just, this was like three years ago, discovered in Mindanao. Um, Leonardii, which goes up here, which was discovered about four years ago, named after Leonardo Paul. Um, so these are species. So we are actually a center of diversity of Rufficia. So we decided to look at two species. Rufficia legaste um, is, uh, was one that was named by Father Blanco um, in the 19th century. Uh, and this is where it grows. So this, this is the range. It's actually fairly widespread. And the other is this rare species, Rufficia leonaria, which is named after Leonardo Paul, the botanist who was killed um, two years ago. Um, so very tragic. So we decided to sequence the genomes of these two species. And the reason we did that is we actually had data that said that the genome was not very big. It was like less than rice, 300 megabits. It turns out that I was completely wrong. You don't even know the size of the genome, but it's not 300 megabits. It's very large. Uh, so we sequenced Rafflesia legaske. 
when we get our data, we're able to get the mitochondrial genome. We're able to assemble that. That's not a problem. Very easy to assemble. We're able to get that. The nuclear genome is just in progress. Eh, we're never going to make this. I mean, it, it, we don't know what the size of the genome is, but I, I, when we had the sequence, I, I, I worked with a friend at, at Dow Chemical. He's the, he, well, he was the one who sequenced the Cassava genome. And he said, sure, I'll help you assemble it. And then he got MIT involved because he couldn't figure out what's going on. And he called me and said, Michael, are you sure about the size? He says, we don't know what the size of this genome is, but it's not 300 megabits. It's probably the gigabits range. Um, we can't assemble it. So we gave up on that. But the interesting thing was the chloroplast genome. And that we couldn't find the chloroplast. So remember, the mitochondrial genome we were able to find. The chloroplast genome, we could not find it. Um, so here's the mitochondrial genome. We're asking we're able to draft assemble. Uh, and the chloroplast genome, you can't find it. And so if you look at different plant species or even algae, if you get genome data and try to assemble mitochondria and chloroplast, you're usually able to get both mitochondria and chloroplast. This is just the amount of coverage of both of those organellular genomes you can find, except for flecia. You have mitochondria, you can't find um, chloroplast. Now remember that um, the species is non-photosynthetic. Okay? So it actually doesn't have chloroplast. However, for a lot of parasitic plants, and there are a lot of parasitic plants that are known, they don't have the chloroplast, but they still have the chloroplast genome. They still have what remains of the chloroplast genome. It's hanging. Even the malaria parasite, which is not photosynthesized, I don't know, still has a remnant of the chloroplast genome. So actually there were these, these theories that somehow you needed some part of the chloroplast genome, even though you don't photosynthesize it anymore, that you still had to hang on to one or two genes. And that's why you can never lose the chloroplast genome. You can lose the chloroplast, but you have to have the chloroplast genome around. We couldn't find it for a flea shot. And we did all of these different controls. Um, we did find small pieces of chloroplast genes that were really messed up. And when you look at them more closely, they actually look like they came from the host, the vine host. They were horizontally transferred into a flea shot. Um, they, uh, this is just the data that shows that. Okay. And so we were left with this interesting idea. Chloroplasts came in very early in the evolution of plants. Mitochondria was even earlier. Um, there are examples where you lose the chloroplast but never the chloroplast genome. Rofflesia might have been the first plant in which you cannot find a chloroplast genome. So we published a paper, this was like first big paper in the Philippine Genome Center, I think, I'm not sure if it's first, but it had a passive hundred, not passive. So, what the Philippine Genome Center did on from our group and everybody. It was published only uh, a month ago, uh, a year ago. Okay. And it was interesting, right? We now know the chloroplast genome. And then in the same week, remember, before that, everybody had seen a chloroplast genome. We published ours in the same week, another paper showed up, plant physiology for this algae, they also did some of the same things we did. They couldn't find a chloroplast genome. So before, while well, there were no examples, now we have two examples of the lack of a chloroplast genome. And this is really a very botanical thing, but for botanists, this is kind of interesting. There's nobody thought it could be done. So it actually made use again. So Jean Molina is great because she's a very quiet, very shy, very, you know, very, Unassuming, one you know, uh, scientist. She doesn't like controversy. She just likes to do her work. She doesn't like, and she has result. Her work has resulted in two of the most controversial papers in the lab. And you have to convince her that we can publish it. She's always nervous. That that you know, I, I can't take the pressure of this. I said it'll be fine. I'll take the pressure. But of course, I said this is going to make the news. And of course, I was right. You know, so you know, the scientists had the news. Uh, this is a stupid headline from the science. From science. When is a plant no longer a plant? Of course it's a plant. It's just it's a chloroplast genome. Nature of these genetics had the study that, and the algae study together. And then of course in the Philippines, because it was a plant. Got news, the GMA news covered it, Rathway covered it. Um, so, so it was, it, was it, 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 it fulfilled what we did. We discovered something interesting. Our genomics from a Philippine species, and we made a splash. It's what we wanted to do for the Philippine Genome Center. Uh, so that, that's where the story 
Um, th that's what the story there uh, was. So um, I already gave you the conclusion. By the way, aside from those remnant plastic genes, the mitochondrial DNA of Rafflesia, a large portion of those genes look like they got it from the host uh, as well. And both of these, this is data that Jean is still working on. She, she thinks she can show that the parasitic relationship occurred. It's a long relationship. It's a very long relationship. It's not something that occurred recently. Okay. So those are just several stories about how genomics can tell something about biodiversity in crops and in non-crop species. And hopefully, as we begin to apply these genomic technologies, it will both teach us about what's going on in nature, tell us about the process of diversity and evolution, and be useful, at least in the, in the crop world, uh, in giving hints as to what new genes might be important as targets um, for breeding. So I'd like to end by acknowledging this is my group that works on domestication, and some colleagues that work, that work on domestication in the past. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is the reflection group. This is the reflection group and our collaborators. These are the people in my lab, and these are the collaborators that are working on reflection from different groups. Uh, and then this is the domestication. This, this, this is my crop group. So um, this is from New York University. And these are past members of the lab. They now have their own lab, so we're working on domestication. Uh, well, and while you know, these are my collaborators uh, in, in that field. And so that's all I wanted to say. I keep on time. So I just wanted to thank you for your attention. And I'm open to answering any questions. Michael, when we went to, to Batanes, northernmost part of the Philippines, we saw date-like plants, and when we tasted the small fruits, they tasted like dates. You know, I gave this talk at La Salle yesterday, and they said the exact same thing. What is that species? You know? I have no idea. It's I want to sample that species. something. Yeah, it's not the oh, Phoenix, Phoenix. It's something. a phoenix. It's a phoenix. I know Philippines not the center of origin of I don't know Phoenix. How brought it there. Migratory birds maybe. Or humans actually may have brought it, but, but Impossible. You know, they grow wild. Good. They grow wild they are. Do we know what the species is? I don't know. I, I want to a sample. Maybe when Wrights goes to Batanes. He oh yeah, you can find them. Get some get some leaves. Yes. <laughs> and they're delicious. Yes, are they are they sweet? Oh. Because if you eat wild, uh, the, the, the relatives of dates, um, they're bitter, they're hard and bitter. Very sweet. Really? Yes. That's interesting. I would love to have salmon. That's right. What? No, we're flying Sunday. No, we're flying Sunday. No, don't worry. You can keep it here. Or make the DNA and send me the DNA. We'll, we'll, we'll collaborate. We'll put we'll, you we'll, 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 Your question. Uh, any other questions? Yes. yes, yes, yes. Please use the microphone. I'm just curious about the issue of your metabolism. Right. In, in the process. Right. So I, I saw that, I, you mentioned that uh, there's variation in dexokinase. And in biochemistry, exokinesis is the first step of glycolysis. And glycolysis is essential for right. the metabolism of uh, how can that happen? That's a um, very, very good question. How, how does, uh, uh, if the exokinase is truncated, because, as uh, you said, uh, the, there's pre premature stop and uh, it can then the enzyme as an athlete. So how does it carry out? That's an excellent question, and that worried us. There are four copies of the gene, and this is the copy that is highly expressed in the fruit. But there are other copies that are expressed in the fruit at a lower level. Um, but so 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 it has backup copies, it has duplicate copies. And then you're very, you know, it's a very good question because you're right. I mean, this should be dead. If it's not copy. So. 
One interesting crop to work on, which is truly ours, is Musa Textilis, the Amma. Yeah. We don't know how much variation we have, but I'm sure there is variation. So the Philippine Genome Center with, um, with, uh, with Abaca Valoriana is already working on Abaca, and it, it's going to be an interesting, uh, an interesting project. Uh, I really think you're right. You're absolutely right. That would be a very interesting. Or P, which is also P, ours. Which canarium, is canarium of Yeah, so, so the Philippine Genome Center here at the PLP actually is working all those endemic crops. We started the one with the endemic crops. The Philippine Genome Center. I'm sure there are maybe more interesting questions. For the, for, for the younger members of the audience, if you want to ask, you can ask me how come I'm a photograph of Jake Gyllenhaal and why is he interested in science? How many people know Jake Gyllenhaal? You, right? Come on! 